So uh, how do I sound? Sexy. I figured, you know this, and I, our audience doesn't know this, but like a year ago, I, you remember I had nose surgery, deviated septum, all that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought it was too much cocaine, but turns out you've never <laughs> done drugs. <laughs> no, but you know what? I have been sniffing something, <laughs> and it's really bothering me because for the last year, I've had to be on this nose spray. And... I swear the pharmaceutical industry has like a secret meeting every year where they gather, they get all these scientists together and they're like, all right, team, our mission here is like crystal clear. Let's make sure every medicine tastes like a blend of expired fruit and like with a sprinkle of despair. (laughs) I mean, I get it, right? They want us to take it seriously, but sprinkle some sugar or like a hint of chocolate in there. Like this spray goes in my nose. Pour some sugar on. Yeah, the spray goes in my nose, goes right down my throat. Like, I want to feel like I'm getting healthier, not like I'm, you know, auditioning for Survivor. (laughs) Ah, It tastes awful and it does not go away. I have to drink like I I can drink a cup of coffee, eat breakfast. The taste is still there every day for the last year. Wow. I'm surprised I'm still here. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Call 911. (laughs) This is Taming the Hustle. Or something of the sorts. The whole nose thing really bothers me, but you know what? I'll get over it. It's all good. Listen, we have a guest today, and I am super excited. I just want to say a few lines about her. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Thank God it's not cocaine. (laughs) I told you, I'm snorting medicine. (laughs) A couple lines about our guest. Let's be clear. (laughs) Listen, we got someone who we got connected with on social media and really became an inspiring figure for me anyways. Her genuine honesty, her care for your well-being is what makes her great at what she does. And the energy that this rock star has makes me super (sighs) stoked about this episode. It's going to be great. It's personal and business coach, the founder of Six Figure Systems. And I'm going to try not to make too many dad jokes today. I'm just going to wing it. (laughs) Megan, wing. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Megan. Okay, so for anyone that doesn't, well, hey, everybody, I'm Megan. Um, and I used to be an elementary school teacher. And so I feel like by proxy, I've been adopted into the dad joke community. And <laughs> it's very important to me. So it actually is the perfect introduction. That, that's actually <laughs> why you did the podcast today. You're like, Daryl is so childish. I can handle him. I've dealt with yes. children before. <laughs> I'm super stoked to have you uh, on our program today. Thank you so much for joining us. Me too. Thank you guys so much for like asking me. I We kind of like, I guess, followed each other on Instagram. And then yeah. you guys were like, hey, let's do this. Thing. And I'm like, I would love to. So I'm excited. So let me explain how I got to the point of finding you. So my team and I, we're always on Instagram. We're looking at trends, whatever. And we always see those business coaches that are going to sell you a program for $19.95 a month. And it's always bullshit. And it's always, you know, you're going to get a PDF and a calendar and a bunch of hashtags that are going to actually do nothing for you. But you gave that person 20 bucks. And if 5,000 people give that person 20 bucks, they've had a pretty good month or year. But with you, you have a real following. All your followers, they're not fake. You didn't buy them. You can see that they're real, that they're business owners. And you're actually coaching them. And your testimonials ring true to that because we see the videos of them talking about how you've affected their lives, how you've affected their businesses into a positive atmosphere and a beneficial one financially. When we saw you and I saw Six Figure Systems, the first thing, like, obviously, I thought was like, um, here we go again for the hills. (laughs) Exactly. But the thing (laughs) is, is I started to look through your Instagram, watch some of the videos you post and listen to you on other people's podcasts and such. And I got to see how authentic you were and how real your program is and that you weren't this fake money grabbing Instagram account. Yeah. Well, and it's I, I really appreciate that feedback because to come into having a business and not having any business experience. Like I was saying, I was a teacher before I became a a coach. I also, I was pre-med before that. So I really, I had no experience in the marketing and sales world. And I've noticed a trend, I think post-COVID, that lots of us are creating businesses because 
we realize like, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I have these unique gifts and talents. Yeah. kind of want to do something with it before I die. So that's kind of like the pod of people who I attract and who I am, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the fact that you recognize that you have talents is something that is sometimes really difficult to come to terms with. Oh, yeah. Well, and for me, it was one of those things that like, I, I couldn't understand it. Like why as an elementary school teacher, I was like, I obviously like it was an interest of mine. So I started my business. I had been getting life coaching for years and I knew I never wanted to start a business, which I think is a lot of us. Like we're like, nope, never <laughs> wanted to start a business this is not the plan. And I really like I got full on obsessed and I would listen to like all these coaching podcasts and like literally like 700 in a year. Every time when I'm on my way to school, I'm listening. I'm doing my own self-coaching every day. Nice. This and is while you're still teaching. It was while I was still teaching, yeah. And um, <laughs> it's funny. I was like no stranger to like doing like additional work, but I felt like I was working like because I were, had a couple of side jobs for a while. So I had um, like I would overnight babysit and like nanny. And then I was the after school person. And I also would babysit and I was a yoga teacher. And so I like had at one time five jobs. <laughs> Just Which like really are small jobs. businesses, by the way, yeah, the yeah. babysitting oh, exactly. and all that. Exactly. Exactly. But um, I think that when coming back to what you were saying about like the unique gifts and talents, it was like, I recognized that like I was able to make the changes in my life that really helped my life. And it just became like abundantly clear that I was like able to help other people create that change too. And nice. so it's like kind of like starting and following that like first hunch, like, oh, I'm really A, interested in something and B, I can help other people. And it when it becomes like just so overwhelming, like, oh my God, I, I have to tell people. That's a lot of times when I feel like the business gets started. So I have to say I'm I'm really attracted by kind of your story and your purpose and your delivery process as well too. Like I'm super turned off about these people that are like, yeah, we're going to teach you how to make boatloads of money. It's really about the selling <laughs> process like we mentioned earlier. Yeah. But see, my financial planning practice is like our tagline is live well today while planning to live well tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we really pride ourselves on the holistic approach to the financial financial planning process. And there's really like a really big emotional and relationship part to it where like I could see that vibrate with what you're doing with your clients. I mean, if you mm -hmm. look at your social media platform, you've got testimonials, you've got people that are proud to be working with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that you're selling, you know, financial success, but you're selling this holistic success of having the work-life balance that you keep preaching mm -hmm. about and having mm -hmm. the right relationships in your life. What I've learned in life, because I've been doing this for 25 years, because I'm a boatload older than you guys, um, <laughs> is that if you have the right relationships with the people that you work with, you're going to have more fulfillment in life. You're mm -hmm. going to keep those clients. So you're going to have less turnover and you're going to be able to help them more. You know, so it's yes. obvious that what you're doing is genuine and it's working because you're developing real relationships with people that you're proving to them that you give a fuck. Right. And that's yes. to me is everything in life. It's worth more than money. Success is that you're having an impact of the people that you're working with. Well, like the thing that I think has been a big shift for me is in just in general, even recently, is that like a lot of us. And so I, I live in the U.S. I live in North Carolina, Raleigh people. Fun. I'm here. Um, but it's like interesting because I think a lot of us are kind of sold this message and a lot of things in like, I think our culture are like, okay, you have to work to live instead of live to work. And then when you're in the work to live culture, I mean, like I was saying, I worked five jobs. It was just like, yep, we just have to keep working all the time. And time is value. And that has been a huge paradigm shift. Like when you run a business, Time is not the value that you actually are able to bring in and create money in your business. It's about the value that you're giving people. 100%. And one of the things that like happens, but especially for business owners. So if we're like living to show up for work, when you're thinking about the way that you're able to show up for your people, you are only focused on work. You're not focused on who you are and how you're able to show up for them. And I think a lot of pieces of the work-life balance piece that I've realized, for me, I'm uh, having that pre-med background. I, a lot of times, like I want to know the science behind it. Like why? Like that's a lot of why I love the coaching piece of like business coaching. It's like, okay, but what's the deeper why? And the reason is when your brain is in a constant state of work, you have no ability to access like 
that creative side of yourself. And I've been learning a little bit more about the nervous system. I am not an expert by any means, <laughs> but like when we are like in a constantly activated stressed state, which a lot of us are when we are working in our businesses, yeah. what happens is we are in our sympathetic nervous system. So we're like just in it. We're kind of active. We're kind of worried about like what people are thinking about us and all those kind of things. And we can even get into like the dorsal vagal phase, which is where we get like completely burnt out. And like literally what's happening is your brain is shutting off even like logical reasoning. So like you're actually like when you're feeling stressed, you actually can't even think logically. I think a lot of the way that we can de-stress is by actually like getting into lives that we love and we've created. And then we can come back to our business feeling really like rejuvenated. And that's in your like ventral vagal stage. Again, for anyone who's like nerdy like me, I'm like, oh, there's like a scientific reason as to why if you're working all the time, feeling stressed all the time, it actually doesn't work in your business. And Absolutely. why having those robust relationships and that work-life balance, it actually like logically works because then your brain is actually thinking logically instead of being stressed. And I have no understanding of the science behind it, but just having lived in business most of my life, I completely understand that. When you get to a point in your career where you absolutely adore every moment of what you do, it's mm -hmm. no longer like work. Like I, I have some people that look at me and say like, you're a workaholic. I'm like, fuck no, I do what I love doing every day. It's not work for me, right? There's yeah. a difference there. Because mm -hmm. then you have the ability to, like you say, to stay focused, to continue with your creative thought process and just leave like, you know, there's stressful moments in the day, but to leave the stress kind of outside of the equation to allow you to really focus on the task at hand. Yeah. I like just the other thing that I was thinking about as you were saying that was when you're thinking about like having the value and like being able to create a life that like just like fills you up. You mentioned before you were talking about like, okay, like within the money, it's like you could have all the money in the world and still feel like funky. It's like, I think when you build up your emotional wealth, it's almost like the financial wealth comes is like a, a cycle yeah. of it too. Cause people, if you As think a about like product, yes. Who, and also who's going to buy, like when you're thinking about selling something, do you want to buy from someone who's feeling lit up and loving their life? Or do you try to buy from somebody who is like really like down in the dumps and is feeling like exhausted? But yeah. that's the thing. It's you have to love what you do, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of a question I have for you is what is a common challenge or like if, if I'm one of your clients, what is something that you you generally see from them? Like, what is it? Is it that stress level? Is it that they, the, the unknown factor? Is it that they don't know where to go, what to do? Because I, I deal with business owners all the time on the marketing end of things. And a lot of times, uh, uh, almost more often than not, it's I have all these ideas. I Should I do this first? Should I do that first? Should I do this first? And then I can see the ball of stress just starting to build. So what is it on your side? Like as a coach, what do you see more often? So for me, I think it's a mix of both pieces, which is, it's interesting because when you're thinking about marketing yourself and marketing your business, I think that the there is a piece of just like believing in yourself and having confidence to share what you do. And that's what we were talking about kind of before with like, when you are so passionate about something, it just kind of like flows from you. And that's when I think like a lot of the best marketing comes out. But in order to actually let yourself feel safe enough to share, I think there's a lot of mindset drama that comes in. Like, yeah. What For are sure. people going to think about me when I am sharing something that I truly believe in and I'm passionate about it? How can I deal with some like feeling that rejection, that failure, that abandonment from maybe people who you respected in the past? There's a huge self-concept shift that comes from that where it's not like you are untouchable, but it's almost mm -hmm. like you have to get mentally to the point where you're like, I can feel safe enough to share and I can create the feeling of confidence, even if I see people might not love what I'm sharing or people might disagree with it. And then when you're doing something that really does feel like, okay, this is right, you're going to experience people saying negative things. And you're also going to know that like you're doing your life's purpose. So it's like, it's like you have to get to that balance where mentally yeah. you're ready. And then there's like the strategic component as well when you're like, okay, I just don't know what, what I'm doing. Like I had no clue what to do with my marketing. Like when it came, I just started posting on social media. You know, I think you're great at that organic side of the marketing, which is yeah. it's subliminally marketing yourself while still telling the story while still helping clients. Right. 
And that's the organic piece that I think you're great at. I think organic marketing is two pieces. I think it's giving value and I think it's making genuine connection. So I think that speaking to the giving value piece, I like to think about, okay, what is my ideal client? What kind of valuable things do I have to offer them? And so when I was um, thinking about like business owners, I was like, there's a marketing piece. There's also a selling piece. And I'm talking, so I work with a lot of times solopreneurs. So they're wearing all the hats. They're doing all the things. Yeah. What are the pillars of the pieces that they're doing? What What are they? So it's marketing, selling, delivering to their clients, making sure that they are planning, presenting, like doing presentations and talking with other people and managing. So those are like the six pieces I was like, okay. These are the things that I think my ideal client would find valuable. If I'm talking about managing their time, that's something that's huge for people, making mm -hmm. sure they have a way to – or managing their mind around things. If it's planning, I'm like, okay, are, are you forecasting? Are you figuring out – do you know, even know what forecasting means? It's like a yeah. lot of us who are passionate <laughs> and don't have any business experience are like, what even is that? So yeah. I'm like creating like a safe place to like learn and also – um like answer questions that I perceive that person would ask. So that's like the giving value piece. And then there's also like, and we can chat about this, a networking piece, but I want to see what you guys think about like, that's how I like to do my marketing. And I focus on a different topic a week. So I'll be like, okay, this whole week, we're going to talk about why presentations are important. And this week we're going to talk about why planning is important. And we'll talk about, you know, so that's kind of how I think about the giving value aspect of organic marketing. I think we're like twins, Megan, seriously. No kidding. Really? I go into clients meetings. Okay. Whether it's a thousand dollar client or a client that's got 5 million bucks, it's like, here are the five pillars of financial planning. Let's yes. make sure that we've studied all of those and how they're going to be impacted in your day-to-day -day life. And how do we find the weak points? What are the risk assessments for each of those pillars? And let's make sure that we have a really good plan of attack to make sure we solve those for you. And I'm hearing you speak. I'm like, oh my God, this is like speaking my language. I love it. This is it. Well, and I think that like when you make marketing, like, okay, I'm just going to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. First off, it, you want to make sure that it's relevant within your frame of business. Like, oh my gosh, yep. I could talk about like a revelation that I had with my cat. And it's like, that might not be relevant for my humans. Like, you know, so exactly. like, and then like, I think one of the pieces about business that scares immediately is that like, okay, how does this actually fit in? So for me, it's like, I have a whole spreadsheet and it's like, okay, each week I'll talk about a different topic. And then I'll also be like, okay, for the first post of the week, it's all for my cold leads. So I'll be like, okay, these are for people who've never met me before. Yeah. I want to share about my personal philosophy of why this piece of selling with like non-sleazy selling is like a huge piece in a part of yeah. who I am. Non-sleazy, I love it. You know, because it's, it's so like, it just, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like exactly, it. You, it totally resonates what we don't yeah. like. I love it. Well, because so many people like think sales and they think the bad car salesman. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think of selling as building people's dreams, helping them see how it could be a possibility, and then giving them the way I could strategically fit into that totally different way of thinking about it. So if people are coming and seeing me, I want them to know that's who she is. They're like, oh, I maybe haven't heard that before. Or like I thought selling had to be like really intense and it's actually a super fun conversation. So that's like a piece of what I do on like the Monday post. And then on the Tuesday post, I like actually want to teach them like a strategy. So being like, okay, when you're on a, if it's that sales is like that week, I'd be like, how can you have a sales call that doesn't feel sleazy? And it's like, how can you make sure that you are having like an open conversation? And that means like, having this like opportunity for people to like tell you what their objections are in a way that doesn't feel weird to you when you're on a sales call. So I like maybe that value that week would be like, okay, what are your reasons why and why not for working with me? No pressure at all, but I want to hear what you're thinking and things like that. Sometimes that can be really helpful for people to be like, oh, I want to make a decision. And then on Wednesday or like the last post of the week, I'll do a testimonial to be like, and also this is for the hot leads. This can help you. Like, yeah. I promise I can help you. If you don't, I do a money back guarantee. Like, but also yeah. look at all these people. Like, I know you can do this. They've done it. So here. I call this the humanizing factor. I mm -hmm. do it with everybody we do with marketing. I preach it. I probably beat it like a dead horse because it's just, it's so important to humanize yourself. And like you said, in your first post of the week, it's important for people to know who you are. And, you know, if this was the 60s and the 70s and even the 80s, it's like that advertising was 
sell me a product because mm-hmm. we've never seen it before. It was always yeah. something new and flashy. And it's like, holy shit, this is amazing. I've never seen a Walkman before. What is a cassette player? Yeah. I've never seen that. That's new. Yeah, sell me that product. There's really generally nothing that wows us anymore as far as the new factor goes, because, mm-hmm. you know, we're we're constantly just building on what we already have. Mm-hmm. So marketing has turned where yeah, you can still sell a product. Apple still sells a product, but they sell more of their name than they do their product. Whereas a small business or just a, like a, a single business owner or a coach or whatever it is, they have to sell themselves. That's why I say I call it the humanizing factor because exactly what you're doing, it, it humanizes you to show people you're just a regular person. You're yes. not trying to steal their money. No. <laughs> In fact, I was like, it, 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 that was a scary part of like, knowing I could help people and charging for it also, it's like I try and give as much free value as I can away. Like I'm like, I hope that you can build a six-figure business literally just by looking at what I post. Yeah. I, I genuinely want that for people. I want it for everybody. I think that financial security that it could bring to your life, like it's yeah. invaluable and I I hope that they can get that. And I also know that there are people that are going through like unique struggles and circumstances that like, what is that fear to create that visibility? What is that like? So it's like, if I'm giving strategy, it's like, there's also like that piece. It's like, okay, are you scared to share? It's just like, are you scared to share your face? Everyone has different feet. Like we all have like a lot of the same core fears and you're like, oh, it's like, I'm scared of people rejecting me. Like that's a pretty human fear, but it's like, that's why it's like when, I want to coach with people and I know I couldn't like for my job in order for me to like invest in myself and actually like make money. I wish I could coach all day for free, but I also do think there is value and merit in charging for that too, you know? And in one of our prior podcasts, we talked about valuing and understanding your value and knowing what you're worth. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's really important. I mean, we created this podcast, uh, without any intention of monetizing it because we wanted it to be an extension of what we do so that we can genuinely help people. So if we can help Mm non-clients, that's fine, but it'll also help our existing clients kind of reflect on things and topics that we want to bring to the table to make sure that, you know, we're helping as many people as we can. I totally feel what you're trying to do. And I really like the idea on a lot of your posts that it resonates with most people that there's fear and doubt, right? And that's usually the biggest hurdle when it comes to business, whether it's our clients, when we work with clients that want to take the leap, like yourself, you know, we've had teachers that have quit, the people that work in government that wanted to go and, and uh, get into business for themselves. And then the biggest thing is fear. It's the fear of the unknown, the uh, doubting themselves and a fear of failure, right? It's like, if you throw fear of failure out the window, there's pretty much nothing you can't do. And I think that like the interesting piece about it is like, I think that having a business is like one of the best forms of self-development that you could possibly do. Because when you are putting your business out there, it's like, it brings up all your stuff. And I think soon we're going to talk about like all my stuff that I've had to work through and like my story and like just how it's shaped who I am and who it's become. So the fear of like putting yourself out there, I want to normalize it, that there is not a single entrepreneur that doesn't have the fear going into it. It's just that ability to know that you have your own back when you're scared. And you also know how to like emotionally and mentally process all the things it takes to put yourself out there. That's what I think like really is able to like help people really just take that leap. We need more of you, Megan. We need more Megans in this. Yeah, no kidding. I think there are. They just need to be realized. I was like, I think there's waiting to be like. I'm so happy you're on the show. This is great. Me too. Hey, listen, we're going to take a quick break. But uh, when we come back, I want to talk about, you kind of touched on it before, um, just things that happened in your life that maybe were a little dark that kind of brought you to where you are today. I would love that. So honored to share. We'll be right back. Is it a boat that you dreamed of, or maybe owning a cafe, or just annual trips to Europe? No matter the goal, pursue your desires now while securing your financial future. It's living well today while planning to live well tomorrow. Hashtag call Renee of St. Cyr and Associates. Welcome back. We're still here with Megan Wing, founder of Six Figure Systems, who, God, you are just a breath of fresh air. (laughs) But listen, before the break, I kind of hinted that we're going to talk about something a little more serious, and I want to know about little Megan, little grade yeah. six Megan, because I've watched this video on your Instagram 
and you sucked me right in with this story because this is obviously everybody has a different story but there is something that shaped everybody the way they are today and Mm -hmm. whether you know sometimes that's a that's a good situation sometimes that's a it's a darker situation i just want you to tell us about little grade six megan yeah she's a I think that there is just so much to share and I want to offer this like as the beginning of the story to say that I don't know if everything happens for a reason. I think that there are a lot of things that like happen that I don't understand that are really like quite horrible and tragic things that happen to people. And I also don't know it all. So I like to think about like, okay, even if there is something that goes on that's really dark. I like to find a reason for everything. And I think that struggles can shape us to become the people we're meant to be. So that all being said, um, grade six Megan, she actually was grade five Megan. So I'm going to have to like do a little bit of backstory. So I was a person, I think that like sometimes bad things can happen to you. And then there are also times that like you do things that are like you're less than proud of. Um, And both of them make you who you're supposed to be. So like I went through some serious trauma in like first and third grade that was like building me up to creating this like persona of me that was a people pleaser and it got so much worse as time went on. But I always just wanted to be accepted and liked, I think as so many of us do, we all want to be seen, heard and understood. What I found is that I had this driving like many of us do to be accepted by like the popular kids. So like I really wanted to be liked. I wanted to be like a member of like the leaders, you know? So it's like, and I was always a follower up until that and pretty much like until later on in my life. But what happened is I was friends with the girl who was the queen bee. And I don't know if you heard this part of the story, how that came to be the sixth grade Megan. So I had a, a very large role in it and I've, I don't, I think I might have shared this on Kelsey's podcast, but this is maybe the first time I've ever shared it publicly like this. But what happened is I had been through a lot and I became friends with the popular girl. And I was like, okay, this is great. Everything is awesome. And meanwhile, I liked a guy who was in sixth grade and this is like all context. So it was like, he was not in the same school for us. He was in middle school. I was in Mm -hmm. elementary school. So it was like a big deal to like someone who was like not in your grade. Yeah. yeah. And we were in the same neighborhood. So we were in like the same, um, like we, that's the only reason I knew him. We were on the swim team together and there was a big, um, movie night at our pool and it was the popular girl also lived in my neighborhood and had never told anyone that I liked this older guy. And I told her, I was like, Hey, don't tell anybody, but I like this guy. And she was like, oh, okay, I won't tell anybody. Goes back to this group of people where he was at and was like, hey, everyone, Megan likes this guy. Like to like this, in my brain at the time, it was a huge group of people. So literally like, I don't even remember this. I knew it had happened, but like I slapped her. Oh. In front of everybody, like y'all, me as a human, I was just like so triggered. I just like was like violence, and it was like <laughs> not a great solution, guys. It was <laughs> violence is not the answer, and also like but she culture, deserved it. She deserved <laughs> no, it. No, yeah. well, so I I learned a lot. I'm a, so I'm, like, I'm a former hockey player. That that's oh my do. dad was a yeah. hockey player, and I played hockey for a little bit. It's not socially acceptable at pools. I've learned. Um, if you were my like, daughter, I would have said, "Slap that bitch, Megan." Right? Yeah. No, it was not. Well, and like so, this is like the a huge source of like my trauma was like that decision. It was like, oh my god, like mm. what the fuck was I doing? I was like, this is not a great plan. However. So I, I do that. And I was like, this is not a good idea. And, and like everyone was just like, Megan of all people is just like going around slapping people. I was like, yeah, not a good choice. So I'm like, I, I and she slapped me back, of course. Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, probably not a great choice. So I like go into the bathroom, like get myself pulled together. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to go and apologize to her. Be like, hey, sorry this happened. Meanwhile, her sister's in high school. And so she is pissed, like as a sister probably would be. And gets a group of all these high schoolers. Remember, I'm in an elementary school or high schoolers. Oh very large difference in age and no authority. So all I remember is they formed a circle around me 
and just started like screaming and cursing me out of this pool. And I like literally like collapsed and I like had my hands over my head and I oh was like, gosh. Meanwhile, all these like adults are like watching this happen and they're like, cool with this. Like it was like just an interesting That's time. Insane. So, but like, again, I don't know if this happened to me. Like, I don't know if everything happens for a reason, but I think this, I, I'm going to use it for me. Um, so I go back up to her and she's like, it's fine. No big deal. Like, I'm like, okay, thank you so much for forgiving me. I'm really appreciative. So I go to school my first day. Of but she grade. never apologized for telling everyone after you asked her to keep it a secret. No, and, and also we were young, you know, it was like, but also, yeah, like I take responsibility for what I did and surely you did, That's you know, great. and so what happened is we go to that first day of sixth grade and have you guys seen the movie Mean Girls? Yes. yes you guys yes. familiar with that? Yeah. So I go to sit down with all these people who I thought were my friends, like all the other, and they're like, we know what you did. And I was like, oh, oh no, this is not good. So I go and I don't know where to sit. And I was like, okay, I am going to sit in the bathroom. And so I ate lunch in the bathroom um, every day for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and like after that first day, everyone kind of like learned. So I, I think I tried to go back into the cafeteria after that first day or I ate by myself and then I came back the next day. And you know that moment when like everyone looks at you? Like I, in, in that Lindsay Lohan yeah, in the movie when yeah. they, like it was like we knew what you did. And it was like everybody knew. Like I was no longer Megan. Like I didn't have an identity other than like the girl who slapped her. Like you know that was who I was. Yeah, yeah. And so I just like was trying to reckon with that. And like being known as someone for something that was like – hurtful like so now a core piece is like i never want to hurt anybody because it caused me so much trauma so i decided to eat in the bathroom for a while and then um i was suicidal during that time i cut myself like i was like i don't want to live anymore like it was to go through such rejection and isolation and Man. like feeling like i was a failure i had hurt somebody it was like a huge piece of like psychological trauma for me and I remember like like I went through a while of eating lunch in the bathroom I think I remember people like again whether this is like my subconscious has like inflated it to more than it was but I feel like I remember people telling me to kill myself like and I was like yeah I also would like that I don't want to feel <laughs> as negative as I do right now so I um I found reading I got really into reading just to have some sort of an escape my parents never knew. They never knew. I hid it all because I didn't oh, want to wow. hurt them from like seeing yeah. the struggle that I was going through. Also, like what what the fuck is a parent going to do? Like, you know, it's like raise hell in school. Yeah, that's really not going to serve um, yeah, like, the kid who's help. already being yeah, yeah. bullied. You know, it's like there are better ways. So I realized I was like, okay, I'm and, – and like I got to a point when I cut so much and I still continued to cut well into my – seventh grade year but I realized that like I wasn't going to kill myself and I was like okay if I'm not going to kill myself I have to figure out a way to make friends so I yeah. found the people who are readers and I also I hit puberty in fourth grade so I was I was like pretty much have been this size gained a lot of LBs since then but like you know it's like I was very tall too much beer like a lot of acne, <laughs> glasses, braces, the whole nine. Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a star studded dream. And I um, <laughs> went in and I go through and I was like, okay, who has friends? Like who has friends? If I can't, if these people are obviously not going to be my friends, and a lot of people know about this stuff, I've got to make some friends. Who has friends? Skinny people. So let's develop some eating disorders and like, let's oh, just man, like man. not eat or throw up when I From eat. From one to like, the other, yeah. It was a blast and a half. Um, so, but I was like, if I'm not going to end it, let's figure out something better to do with this. And then I became friends with like the people who are readers. And then I realized that there were other people who are like having really dark thoughts. So then became friends with the emo people. So yes, this, this lovely lady, <laughs> super like wore the Fox jackets, like had the thumb holes through <laughs> lots of eyeliner. And that was me for uh, my seventh grade year. And then eighth grade, I decided that people liked super friendly people. So I became, and there is a part of me, I am obviously very friendly, but like peppy and like in a way that like 
I, I also realized that like I was I kind of wanted to talk about like things that like like not to toot my own horn, but I was like kind of smart and like I would talk about things and I think people didn't like that. And so I was like, mm-hmm. I will be the airhead. I was like, I got this role. I was like, don't you don't need to feel threatened by me as a person. I'm just gonna be what? The girl that knows like nothing. Yeah. And so it was a really interesting shift as I like grew through each identity. Trying to figure and, out where you fit. Yeah, figuring out where I fit and figuring out like what I was supposed to do in this world. I think the biggest piece of it was like that I didn't give up. Like, even though I found really, really shitty, like, ways to, like, cope and deal with that trauma, yeah, I which I would not recommend to anybody listening to this anyway at all. Please go and get a therapist and get some counseling and you will get through it. But, like, I think that, like, if I had continued on the path to being one of the popular kids and being, like, in that group, I would have not been kind to my mom. Like, I saw it was modeled for me. I don't think that I would have. And I still, like, had my own ways of not being kind. So sorry, Sue, you're amazing. But like we had our own struggles, but like, I think I would have never become a leader. I don't think that I would have developed resilience and grit like I did to like overcome that. Um, I don't think that I would look for the best in people like I do. I don't think I would be as understanding and empathetic to people going through, like even people who have made decisions that they're less than proud of. I know I never would have like developed the level of empathy and compassion I do for others that if I hadn't been through something really hard and just needed someone to like see me for me instead of a singular event. And I think that like, I wouldn't have been as interested maybe in mental health as I was and like working through that. So it's like when we go through struggles, like I think it's supposed to serve us in some way. And I know that made me the person I was meant to be. And I think that like we were messaging and you were talking about like taking back your story. Yeah. I think a lot of pieces of all of our history and all of our memories, I think that one of the biggest things that I got from coaching is that like I can control my memories and I can choose the way that I want to view my past. And I will continue to do things that I will probably make some poor decisions in the future. And I don't have to beat myself up for them. I can show compassion to myself. And from that, other people can grow and get help too. So that's an attestation of uh, things happen for a reason, right? Because it really helped shape who you are today. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing I think you, you mentioned early on when you first started to cut yourself and when you came to the realization that you weren't going to try to commit suicide. Everything happens for a reason, as you're saying, but it's like at that young age, you kind of didn't know it, but you were coaching yourself at that point. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Which is crazy to. to think looking back now, I think. Yeah. And, and I've never thought about it like that, but I think I was, and I was just kind of like, we have to figure this out. I was like, we can't go the rest of our life like this. Like, And especially going from the popular girls, then you were like, I'm a reader. Then it's like, then I'm going to be emu and all this stuff. It's like, and not that you coached yourself to get to that point, but I think that it's always been in you yeah. that you could, you could find a way to get out of these situations that you're in or these circumstances to try to better yourself where you're thinking, how can I better yourself? And you, you talked about that earlier, just with coming out of teaching and going into this and saying, I'm going to help kids. And the, but then you realize something was more important than that. And it was a bigger picture. And I think, you know, as much as you, whether you've seen it or not, but it's like, as a kid, I think you were doing that all along. Thank you. I really like, it's interesting to hear you say that. Like, I don't know. It's just like, I never thought about it like that, but I do think that like, if we can like kind of like think I, it's like I think reflect on our past and think about how it's made us a stronger, better version of ourselves and how it's kind of like who we were innately all along. I think that's just so beautiful and like huge. And it's interesting because so many people who I was with this past week, they're all coaches and like not just business coaches. And I just think it's so one of the reasons why I love working with business owners is like we all, I think in our lives encounter a lot of struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just fucking awesome that we choose to take our struggles and like, not just like go internalize and focus on ourselves, but we choose to serve other people, even though we like, it would be so easy to just be like, no, 
Like I have to do self-preservation. And I think like to be really philosophical for a second, it's like I think that this is the growth that humanity is being like called to do now. Yeah. Like we don't have as many of like the survival like struggles that we have. I think we're like all supposed to be like helping grow as a community and be like, okay, we are – going to the next level. That means that we're going to be serving people. We're going to like working together collectively yeah. as the whole. We're like thinking about like all of us, like going to the next level of ourselves. And 100%. that's what I think that a lot of this is all about, you know? Yeah. And that's why I think it's important that you shared your story on Instagram. And that's why yeah. like when I saw it, that, oh man, I, uh, I'm a big softy. I listened to your story and it's like, you know, I was choked up and I'm like, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know, I wanted to know about grade five, Megan. I wanted to know yeah. about, you know, what, how did, how did you get to that point? Like, what was it? But mm -hmm. I think that, that story is important to share because there is going to be somebody, whether it's uh, someone who's in grade six, whether it's a parent who has a child, if we don't share those types of stories, people think it's not okay to share their problems. And I, I feel that with our day in mental health, like, you know, in Canada here, we have this thing, it's called Bell Let's Talk Day, but everyone seems to think that that's the only day we talk about it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we all share our stories on, you know, on mental health day. And it's like, yeah. but every day, it can't just be today. We can't just totally share agree. on social media that day. It has to be every day. What I find really, really powerful with your story is that you figured out a way to plow through it, right? Mm -hmm. Because People, I think it's been made too easy to use mental health as something that is crippling you as opposed to, yeah. to figuring out a way to work through it, right? Yeah. To yeah. become stronger. So instead of mental health being in the spotlight in a sense where we can help people plow through it, it's just, it's almost like it's become accepted that it's like a crutch, right? Mm. Like I often hear people say, well, you know, I can't do that because I struggle with mental health issues. Whereas mm. we all have some form of mental health issue, in my opinion, but mm. how do we develop the right tools to work through that? And like you've done to use it for the positive, right? Instead yeah. of allowing ourselves to use it as an excuse for either failure or not having an impact in, in life in general, whether it's your own or helping other people, how do we be more like Megan? That's interesting that my face is such a, like a visceral reaction of like, I don't know if we should be more like me. <laughs> but like, I think that like, I totally get where you're saying within mental health and the way that I like to think about it. Okay, this is a circumstance. So it's like thinking about like, so I have ADHD. I think a lot of people see that as like a circumstance that is a negative circumstance, or disabled, you know, yeah. instead, instead of being something that is like a superpower. So for like me, because I have ADHD and I struggle to keep my brain organized, guess what is the thing I'm best at? Organizing businesses yeah, yeah. and organizing systems. Yeah. And I think that like, it's like, okay, I've got anxiety. That means that my brain has like a lot of fear within it. That means I'm also really good at finding problems. And if I'm really good at finding problems, I can also be really good at finding solutions. Whatever I'm struggling with in my business, if I can figure it out, this is the biggest thing that my clients are struggling with too. Then I can use this strength to serve me, even if it's not something that like I'm even helping other people with, like my relationships stuff that yeah. I went through. It's like, it made me really viscerally independent. And that is something that like, I've never taught on, but it's like something that I think can also serve people. Listen, Megan, we absolutely love having you. I don't think this is going to be the last time you're on this show. I would love that. I've had so much fun with you guys. I got a feeling that you're going to come back. Whether we call you or you're just going to come, you're like me, you like to talk. So somehow, some way. Yes. I think we're going to get to hear your voice again. I would love that. I think both of you guys are so awesome. So thank you. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Like I said, we hope you can join us again sometime. And, uh, you know, good luck with everything. I know you're still kind of in the early stages, but you're kicking ass doing it. So I don't thank think you. it's luck, Meg. I liked you coming in after this episode. I love you. So I wish you all the best. You are where you belong. So, so appreciate that. And I love you guys too. And I'm so, so thankful for us time. We are so thankful for you. Check out Megan Wing on Instagram, Six Figure Systems. Find her. She is going to help you in any aspect of your life, whether it's personal or business. Megan rocks. That's all I got to say. We're out of here. We'll see you next time. Take care. Ciao.